When selecting an assessment, why is it important to consider whether it is biased against a specific subgroup? I think that there's probably three helpful factors that, that practitioners or users can think about when trying to weigh uh, the evidence and make a decision on that. Um, the, the three things that I typically think about are, um, are there any uh, legal or regulatory statutes or regulations that might preclude the use of a particular tool or instrument against a subgroup? A uh, second a factor might be the kind of statistical evidence that we might have about the tool and whether or not there's um, evidence that maybe we don't want to use it for a particular purpose. And then the third is what I usually refer to as what we call adverse impact factors. Now, I'll, des I'll describe what each one of those are, are pretty quickly. Legal or regulatory statutes. Most people have um, some experience with the first notion about regulatory or um, law issues. So, uh, so for example, with the uh, reauthorization of uh, PL 94-142 back in 1994 was really the first time that we saw verbiage in the federal code that told us that we needed to use multiple instruments in order to safeguard against any kind of bias against uh, certain people or groups. Um, another example people typically would, would experience and somewhere in their training is the Larry P. versus Riles case, uh, which uh, was a, a class action suit in California, and the results of that uh, were that, that uh, 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 practitioners couldn't use cognitive or IQ tests for the identification of African-American boys for, for the sole purpose of identification for mental retardation, as we called it at that time. So those are two examples of um, either regulatory or law factors that might, um, that might either preclude or sway our decisions. Statistical or psychometric standards. The second area, and this is an area where I think the, the center does a really good job, is, is, is there statistical or psychometric evidence that uh, a tool is, uh, may be uh, uh, ill-used for a particular subgroup or population, right? Typically what we look for there are uh, psychometric properties, or reliability and validity. We first want to make sure that the, prop, the, the, that the tool has adequate um, uh, you know, uh, properties with respect to those issues. But then secondly is whether or not the tools then are disaggregated. Are those psychometric properties disaggregated for, uh, uh, for, for categories that we might be interested in? So for example, if we had a tool that had an overall uh, uh, reliability property of 0.9, um, but we were really interested in whether or not what was the reliability for the, uh, of this tool for use with girls versus boys, and we found that there, was a, that there was a divide between those two levels of reliability, it might suggest to us that we probably don't want to use, or we might want to use with caution, that tool for making decisions for, for one group or another. Right? Uh, the other kind of statistical evidence that we might want to look for is whether or not the tool provides um, differential prediction to yet another variable. So, for example, if we're using a, a tool or, or a measure to predict performance yet on a second measure, um, and the tool either over or under predicts uh, uh, scores or performance on the second measure as a function of category, then um, uh, that might be evidence, again, that the tool might be um, biased for a particular subgroup or category of people. And this is kind of like in line with Arthur, Arthur Jensen had talked about with the use of IQ tests. Adverse impact. And then the third approach, um, and, and potentially the most important, is what I call adverse impact. And what I mean by that is, do, do the, the resultant scores on a test, and more importantly, the interpretation of those scores, lead to certain categories or subgroups being advantaged or disadvantaged um, as compared to each other? So, for example, if I were to, um, if I were to, if I were to take the, uh, the average height of NBA players and compared it to the average height of um, all men in the nation, there would probably be a difference in those scores, right? Now, is the ruler uh, in that case then uh, um, biased? Probably not. It probably represents the natural order of things. But then if I made, um, if I made set criteria that advantage certain people, such that only people who are minimally six feet four or above could qualify to play in the NBA, then the application of that standard um, um, 
on the observed scores would lead to people being six foot four or above being advantaged in that situation. So we want to, um, so the third important part is that not only are there score differences, and sometimes the score differences in and of themselves are important, okay, because sometimes they do point to potential bias in the way that the test was made, but importantly as well is the way the scores are interpreted, do they lead to one group being advantaged or disadvantaged as compared to another? So just quick summary is that uh, the, you know, the three things I would look for in trying to weigh my decision is, are there any um, statutory or any um, law or regulatory factors that might, uh, might weigh in the decision? Is there statistical evidence that the test or, or a tool is biased um, f uh, for or against uh, a category of people? And then lastly, do the results of the score and the interpretation, can, can they be used in a way to advantage or disadvantage a certain group of people?